Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic to keep myself entertained, talk to my friends around the world as my guests, and to bring education to horse people. This has been one of the most fascinating and interesting things I've ever done, and I just am so thrilled today to have Sharon and Laura Wilsey back for our seventh webinar with Horse Speak. Um, we, we, we always have a general plan, but we never quite know where it's going to go. So um, mm -hmm. I hope you're willing to go for the ride with us. Uh, that's why I have the yellow brick road. You got to follow along. And we hopefully will wind up somewhere that makes sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a good way to start today. And I'm going I'm to put up. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to have these guys introduce themselves for any of you that have not heard of Sharon and Laura and horse speak, and um, then we'll roll from there. If you have questions, just pop them in the chat, put them in the Q&A. Laura helps me with this greatly when, when we have Laura here, so it's really helpful, and we'll get to your questions when it seems appropriate in the conversation. So welcome, Sharon and Laura. It's so good to see you again. It's like, it's like, it's like it gives me a big smile. I always love having you guys. Um, why don't you give everybody just a brief introduction to horse speak so they have some idea of where we're gonna go. All right. So hi everybody, I'm Sharon Wilsey. And I'm Laura Wilsey. <laughs> and we are Horse Speak. <laughs> so <laughs> Horse Speak is, is the precise body language of horses. So it, it's not a broad spectrum, like, oh, you know, you, uh, like there's certain um, training systems that are out there that are aiming at looking at the body language of horses. And that's great, that's wonderful, that there's been an interest and People are really wanting to know more what makes my horse tick. So this, this work is very precision oriented. So I've been able to decode the body language of horses from nose to tail and back again, and then come up with approximate uh, equivalencies that we can do with our body that creates an intrinsic message. And when I say intrinsic, I mean that it's organically recognized by the horse. Something in their head goes, I know what that means because it's a close enough. And the reason that that can happen is because we're both mammals and so that we have certain needs, wants and desires and ways of demonstrating, moving towards something that I desire, that I want, that I feel good, I feel safe, moving away from something I don't like. And so we have hands and arms and they don't, they have a long neck ahead and we don't, but there's a way that we can uh, utilize our postures and our gestures and our signals to make sense to a horse. So, so, so that, Sharon, is a shortcut way to say this, this is horse sign language? Yeah. Yeah. Nailed it. Nailed yeah. it. Got it. Yeah. Got it. I, it's finally dawned on me because that's what we're doing. We're using our body to create. I, I, I can't do sign. I did actually take it for a little while. But, you know, when we're watching all these COVID <laughs> talks, the signer is back there. And so we're using our body to do the sign language that horses recognize because it's innate language to the horse. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Well, Precisely. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's, a, it's a little bit of, it's interesting because we, we do things like, for instance, um, you're walking down the street with your friend and you see a pothole and they don't, and they're about to step in it. You do this at them, you hold them back and you point at the pothole and you say, watch out. And you might even turn your own body towards them protectively. That's so that's a core hand. block. This is a hold hand and that's a directional with attention and the intention is protection. So you just use your body language to stop your friend because you might not even be able to say, watch out, there's a pothole. You might go like what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, you just sometimes, it, you, can't, yeah. you can't get well, the you word You can't out. verbalize it. You just have yeah. like the arm when you're driving and you're going to stop short, yeah. the arm goes out. It's automatic. It's automatic. Just, absolutely. <laughs> right. And so horses recognize that stuff. So what we're trying to do is then put those subconscious mannerisms into a totally conscious awareness and then match them up so the horse with enough slow slow speed so the horse can say funny accent but i know what you mean and and that's why i say it's intrinsic because as soon as you start to look like something they can recognize they pay attention they tune in and they go you're somebody i want to talk to right and so you know so often I think what we do in our communication with horses is where we're coming from our perspective, but we 
We haven't considered the foreign language that the horses must be hearing from us, like you say. And so, you know, like I travel around the world, well, I did, and I would go to different countries and I, I would just nod and smile. Right in Finland, I love listening to Finnish, but believe me, I have I can say hevane, that's horse in Finnish, and lumi, that's that's it, that's the end of my. Book. So I would sit there in a conversation and nod and smile, and you ha you have to wonder how many times horses have been sitting there in the conversation and going, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there are some horses who are what I call more bilingual, so they've been able to because of just their 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 nature their brain uh, decode human better and they're like yeah they're funny and they don't know where their feet are ever but they're cute i'm and gonna keep them around you know yeah. and then there's other horses who are like <coughs> it's an octopus yeah. i don't even know yeah what. i can't make any sense of what those body movements mean to me they're chaotic and random <laughs> and they're kind of scary Mm -hmm. And then we do these postures, sometimes people do these that are really scary. And it's like, yeah. you know, the, the number one thing a horse wants is to feel safe. The number one thing is feel safe. So when we do these like postures that are supposed, and this is where I, you know, I always, when I hear the whole predator prey story, I'm always like, wait a second, folks, if I take you to Africa on a horse in lion country, guess who's the pink squishy thing without fur? You know, <laughs> I see marble. Right, yeah. so we have only <laughs> predators in that we can make tools that are weapons that can kill. But right. innately, like you and I walking around in the woods with a bear, man, we are the prey. Nothing. We got nothing, yeah. Right, and so, you know, I think we've overblown the predator prey thing to, to try to simplify it, but we simplified it to the point where it doesn't mean anything. Right, and you know, the fascinating thing is that we can look predatory toward a horse by approaching them with your hands with up this and, and with your with core this. flailing at them and we actually did a recent um consultation with someone and they were having a hard time catching the horse and they were walking in an x posture core blaring toward the the horse's neck and the horse was running away and we're like okay so, so stop just in this. a little bit make an and o then approach and the horse the muzzle turned and came right in yeah it was totally yeah, I mean, and then like that. and then the horse was like do it again yeah. Do it again. So he kept looking, and I said, "So make another O." And then, the, then she couldn't get rid of the horse. So yeah. horse is like, "Can I?" Well, and so this is kind of interesting because so many of us are taught that we have to like present ourselves and be the leader and be, you know, and get the respect. And and I'm personally, I feel that unless we give respect, we can't ask for respect. Right. That we've got to start with ourselves yeah. with giving that respect to another creature, human, horse, dog, otherwise. Um, because that intention is going to be reflected back to us. They're like, oh, you, you know, you acknowledge me as a being. And so I can acknowledge you as a being. But when we come in and I, I see so many women when they come in, they're like, well, my horse doesn't respect me. And I'm like, well, yeah, because you're not coming from a place of self-respect. Yeah. There's, right? that, there's that whole piece, especially for women that we tend to, you know, kind of, do Not the rub any feathers and that right, yeah right and but we ha but when we and people wonder why you know why am I able to walk in and work with a horse that you know other people because I have that mutual respect before I ever walk in I'm right. I'm not coming in to tell you what to do I'm coming in to see what you're doing to ask you know what are you doing how, how you doing um, and I think that that's like with Surefoot when I approach a horse with Surefoot so many people tell me oh you'll never get a pat under that horse's foot right. and in seconds the horse is like yawning and looking and showing yeah. because the the approach is one of mutual respect and understanding and saying to the horse how do you feel about this exactly mm -hmm. i like to put it in very simply for for a human being to to reframe because it's a lot of like wow it's a lot to take in attention and intention mm. so so first to respect the horse and it doesn't mean you're you're accepting poor manners. That's sure. not what we're talking about. We want good manners, but we, we need to model the behavior we want to see the horse copycatting. So they will, they will uh, it's like water. They'll go to the level that you're at. So if you're, if you're unconfident, or if you're flailing, if you don't know where we're walking to, you don't know where you're going. If yeah. any of those things, the horse is going to copy that behavior. But if you're pay attention to what the horse is paying attention to, it's that simple. Right. If they're looking, you don't know what they're looking at. It's a scary boogeyman. Who knows what it is? 
doesn't matter because they this is where they do scan the horizon and watch out for predators on the fences on that because in nature they are there pay attention to what they're paying attention to give them a moment secure that environment for them and then intention what is your intention as you do whatever you're doing and what is the horse's intention so a lot of times they'll pay attention to something like the fence post and we think, oh, don't do that, don't look, you know, that we, we, we draw a conclusion that's not correct. But if you give it a moment and really look at what they're looking at, really sort of take in the whole nose to tail, sometimes you'll get an inspiration. You're going, no, I think the intention is there's bees on that. And they're saying, don't go there. Yeah. <laughs> and I have literally yeah. had horses yeah. point out where the beehive is. Oh, wow. I wish I'd known today because I went to pull some some um, spearmint out of my garden and I grabbed a bee. Mm. See it. <laughs> it's okay now, but it was like, so I was really, so I, 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 I didn't see the bee. I wasn't trying to hurt you, but anyway. Um, so so uh, the other day I had a guest whom you know, I had Lucinda Baker on. Oh. Yep. And it was such a wonderful webinar and it was the first one back from the, from the break. And I, you know, I was so, it was so much fun for me because She's been through so many different learning styles and models, but you know, lately it's been, she's been working with Steven Peters, as you know, and with you guys. And she really had a beautiful way of kind of talking about horses in that um, with, from the ethology perspective is that they're always um, scanning. Like we tend to kind of, kind of fall asleep, right? We're kind of sitting there and we'll, we, we kind of switch off. Yeah. But the horses are always present in their environment scanning. And so they don't have the kind of switch offs. I mean, we'll see them dozing and sleeping, obviously, but they're they're kind of scanning all the time and perceiving. Whereas um, we're more domesticated, if you will, yeah. <laughs> and so in that domestication, you'll see it in in other animals as well. Is we've lost some of the the more um, perceptive means of our environment because it's less important. You know, we know yeah. when we go in our house, we're safe. You know, um, we know. Um, we just don't have the heightened sense of awareness of our surroundings that horses do because it's not as important to us. Until um, now. <laughs> now we are more, but you know, have a little bit more concern yeah, going out. Oh, absolutely. Like, no, you're right. You're right. And that's the yeah, one thing. That, that awareness has actually increased for yeah. a lot of people. Yes. Yeah. And right. with it anxiety. Because yeah, like you know, when, you when you're into in a store and somebody doesn't have a mask and you're like, mm, oh, I think yeah, 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 that's a horse. Yeah, that's the horse. That's the world. horse's world we're all the time. They're just like, I don't know about that. Yeah, and it's not necessarily panic and run. It's just caution, caution, mm -hmm. caution. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think when you are in Africa, you know, especially when you're with with the guides and you're going through lion country, you're, you're with a group of people who are guiding you who don't shut that off. No, they absolutely don't. Yeah. We have a Maasai at the back and we've got Gordy at the front and he's been out there since he was five. And they, those guys are constantly, so that we can switch off. We can kind of like go, oh, you know, and those, well, because yes, you're absolutely right. They are staying on top of it 100% of the time. You know what's funny about what you just said? What? In a healthy horse herd, <clears throat> that's oh, yeah. exactly what you have. Mm -hmm. You have a map maker in front who's watching and, and the picking the trail. Kicker in the back. And the kicker <laughs> in the back, the protector in the back. And everyone in the middle of the herd, those horses can switch to off a little bit to keep the zero, to keep the kids together and keep it together. And they don't want to have to watch out for all that stuff. So the more protective a horse is, the more they, they flank, pull up the rear and protect. And the, the less capable a horse is of being a protector, the more they want to squish to the middle. And those are the horses that Velcro onto you. Yeah. You know, it, that makes me think of a funny story. This, the second safari I went on in 2010, we had a woman who had jumped out of so many airplanes that she, um, she had no fear, bottom line. And we went onto this huge plane. It was like five miles. There's nothing in any direction, just an open plane. And we went for a gallop and this woman galloped away and disappeared over the edge of the earth, literally disappeared, gone. And a horse had been with her and that horse panicked and came circling back, like screaming his head off to get back to the herd. And our fearless leader tried to send one of our guides out to catch this woman. And that horse said, I am not leaving. Yeah. Sorry. And he just absolutely flat out refused. And so we had to wait for her to come back, but she was on an uh, X racehorse, which they have decided maybe racehorses aren't um, as suited for safari as 
they thought. It's um, all the personality and the role of the herd where they take it. We actually had an experience with a person who took our horse personality webinar and energy types and was conversing with one of her friends and she does trail rides. And the friend is like, hey, I miss having such a hard time with my horses going out. And it's just, and then our friend who took the webinar is like, tell me a little about your horses. And then I think it sounds like they're in the wrong order. And ah. so she said, you know, gave her some suggestions. Do, there were four horses, do them in this order. The next day, the gal had um, gone out and done a, she made her family go on a trail ride and <laughs> test it out and then reported back to our gal who took the webinar and said, it worked. They never had a better trail ride ever. You know, what? so it's, <coughs> oh, pardon you. Sorry for the choke. But it's just, just being aware that different horses are good at certain jobs and some are not. Like some horses are good at doing therapy centers or riding schools or what have you, and some are not. It's just, you can't. <clears throat> well, and it's true of people too, right? Some people are really good at working with other people. Others are better yeah. in the back office. Some of them are like, like super analytical and others are more feely. And so I think we tend to forget that horses um, have these subtle variations. In fact, I think probably all mammals have these subtle variations in our responses. And the, the reason I keep coming back to all mammals is because of vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve that all mammals have, which reports, am I safe? Mm -hmm. um, and we've done some webinars. In fact, we probably need to do another webinar on vagus nerve with my friends. Um, <laughs> because you know, that sense of safety, and that was the one thing that, that um, Lucinda kept bringing up, is the need for safety, whether it's human or horse, is so critical. And right now, so many people are feeling insecure, whether that's financially insecure, emotionally insecure, you know, health-wise insecure. Um, and so we're all in sort of this mode of insecurities, and then how can we find security and stability? And like lately, when I've been thinking about Surefoot, it, you know, security, safety, stability, these are all the words that sure, I see with Surefoot when we put horses on pads, that they can find that and how much we all need that to be productive adults or productive beings, if you will. Right. You know, what's interesting is um, recently there's been a lot of well, I always follow the horses. And so horses that I meet tend to bring up an issue and then every horse brings up that same issue. It's <laughs> funny. I don't know if it's, you know, Akashic Records. I don't know what's going on, but it's, it always happens. <laughs> and lately the issue that they're bringing up and perhaps be, because of what you said is can people, can human beings find their feet, please? Mm. And so I think what they've been describing, for instance, let's say a horse is grazing, but they're coming towards you slowly you'll often see this, they have their nose on the grass and they make an arc and they make an arc back and then they step into that arc. And then they make an arc and an arc back they're like chewing <clears throat> corn and step into that. Oh. They're defining the space they're stepping into and then they're stepping. And even if they're not grazing and moving and they're moving casually, you'll often see this sway in their head. There's a scanning the place I'm stepping, unless they're on alarm and they're running. But if they're right. calm and casual, so, I gave, I've, I've had some, I've suggested this to some people to just make an arc with your finger or even a little circle and then step into that circle and then a little circle and step in, like you're playing um, Twister, but yeah. as you walk around your horse and the horses love it because they say, now I know where you're going to go and you're telling me where you're going to be before you get there. And then horses have even lined up to people, like come in, lined up, given their shoulder and said, let's do this together. Oh, let's, wow. <laughs> let's, just, let's decide where we're stepping our feet and they're loose and they just choose to do it. So it's really amazing because I thought, I, I couldn't help but think of Surefoot mm. <clears throat> and how essential a horse's pl foot placement is to their well-being. Yes. And in and, and such a big sense. And so then thinking about how interesting that once, because my guys, love Surefoot. So they, they get to play with Surefoot and then they bring it to like, I'm going to touch that log. I'm going to stand on a tire. I'm going to, how about this rock? I can roll my hoof. I'm going to go up and down a hill. They just, they got a, um, a you know, a mounting block stairs out there and they'll be out putting a foot on a step and off, you know, just, I'm going to sample everything with my foot. 
and it cracks me oh. up. So it's like they have this need for us to pay attention to their feet beyond just telling them what to do with their feet. We sort of boss them around and say, do this, do that, do this, do that. But in a, on a casual level, on a communication, on a level of just being together as two beings in the same space, they love it when we're exceptionally clear with where our feet, not only where they are, but where they're going to be. Mm -hmm. Well, that, I mean, it's so critical for a horse to place his foot in a way that's gonna be secure. I mean, their foot's a sensory organ. We know that. We know that they're perceiving much more than we could even begin to comprehend through those feet. And so the combination of eyes and hoof scanning, placing, scanning, placing is so critical to this, to the overall well-being of the animal. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, because Dakota, she's blind in her left eye and the right eye, because she has uveitis. So we've been in this constant fighting journey to keep her seeing. Um, but the left eye is completely gone. And it's interesting. We have a couple trails around the property and I'm like staring at the stumps. To say what, don't step, don't on, the step on the stump. What does she do? Steps on the stump. <laughs> and I'm like, God darn it. So it's just that clear intention. So it's like, you know, what I feel like today I was really thinking about taking a walk with one of our totally fine seeing horses is like you do scan in front, but then you need to look forward. You scan, make sure you're not going to kick it, you know, trip over roots or what have you, and then look forward to see where you're going because they need that clear intent from us. And that gives us confidence. Like, yeah, I can see we have this in front of us. We need to step over these roots, but up ahead, we are clear to go. And um, they follow our feet so much, you know, and where our eyes are going. They always say when you're riding, you know, look between the ears, Absolutely. Yep. you know, but then if you're staring at a damn stump, you're going to step on it. <laughs> yeah. well, and, and we don't necessarily think about how they're following our feet, but you bring up such a good point because you know, the eyes obviously are where they're going, but then the steps and the reason what you make me think of is again, when I go back on safari, we, we get off and we walk through some escarpments, right? With lots of rocks and boulders and all the horses are so careful to pick the paths that the horse, the lead has taken. Like they want to step in exactly the same places because the lead horse has already told them this is secure. This is okay. And if you try to take them in on another line, they're like, wait a second, you know, are, is that okay? Because this one, I know right. this one's working and you're trying to take me somewhere else. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's really, like, so body language <coughs> literally means <clears throat> your body is saying something. Every part of your body is saying something. And I'm like, I do this, I'm Italian, so I, I do. <laughs> but when I'm with a horse, there's a lot of palm up is, is to hold the, the invisible, barrier around my bubble and palm down is to calm down and this is intrinsic so I've done this with wild horses and they they look at you and they go well all righty then you show me where the edge of your bubble is and I'll say it's right there okay then well then would you like to say hello yeah I'd love to say hello you know so it's really stunning to see wild horses that have no need for human beings in their world they've got everything they need and especially the ones that, like in Germany that with the safaris will go through and you know they they're not allowed to be fed they're not allowed to be touched so you're just sort of walking by and they don't have a fear of humans but they don't get anything from humans uh and as soon as I start <clears throat> a little bit of gestures you know the the um the guide there is like you have to stop because they're not supposed to come in <laughs> One of, our, the crowd. <laughs> one of our students actually who's on this webinar right now she mm -hmm. went and we were live with her on the phone uh like a couple months ago and the darn horses wouldn't stop coming in because she was doing all the horse speak mm -hmm. with them and the, the guy hysterical. had to literally like shoot Chase them the away right. because they kept coming in <laughs> Oh, funny. I'm like, you're going to get thrown works, out of the, the you it know. It works too well. Space. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is interesting. This gal, um, Kelly, who sent in a comment, I always wave and say hello to my horse from a distance when I see her in a distance in the pasture, and usually she acknowledged me. Uh-oh, you froze. So come when I ask. When I put her back, she <laughs> often followed me to the gate, but I've just started 
using a hand flick like a tail to go away to say bye. She now stands still in the pasture as I leave, but she looks sad. Am I humanizing to think she feels unhappy with the signal, which I mean to signal she's free to go? No, she's, well, first of all, let's take the humanizing part. And second of all, let's take the signal. Yeah. So when you do the signal, you say, that's, we're complete. Yeah. And, and horses will often do that signal back at you. It's a very casual tail flick. So soft gestures, soft breath, soft tail, soft feeling. Strong breath, strong tail, strong stomp, strong feeling, just like us. <laughs> so we get louder when, you know, we, when, we, when we have more feeling, we get softer when we have quieter feeling. And humanizing is to, to, to there's two things to that. You could be projecting something, but on the other hand, you could be empathically feeling that she has a longing, that she has a beckoning, that you know, horses that are bonded with each other don't like to separate. And so if a horse is feeling particularly bonded with us, it may be an accurate sensation in your body that you're sensing the horse really like, is reluctant to separate. You're leaving? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a difference, anthropomorphizing is assigning a horse human value, but having empathy means you you're, you're clear, conscious, and aware of the fact that horses have feelings. They don't have human feelings, they have horse feelings. And mammals have a desire to stick together and bond and know who's safe and who's their buddy and who they should be with. And so if the horse has decided to do that level of bonding with you, then you might feel that kind of tugging sensation and when you're leaving. Right, and when you're approaching, you're doing, you know, you're acknowledging her and then you approach and then you wait. So you're respecting the bubble of personal mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. And so then the horse is like, great. You're you know? safe, you're comfortable. Yeah, and so then you're not just going and invading the horse's space. Mm -hmm. And so the horse is like, oh, we have mutual respect. I'll come in when you ask me to. And then you're saying goodbye appropriately. Yeah. And so is the horse. Yeah. That doesn't mean the horse is like, goody goody gumdrops she's out of here the yeah, horse is like oh, if she feels it's, comfortable and it's safe all over now then yeah. she's having a, that leftover longing and that's yeah. that's a that's a normal sensation and what we don't know about um, the situation is are there other horses in the field that she can go hang out with right, right. or is she by herself in the field so that would be another element that if if the horse felt like we were leaving and there wasn't somebody else to go hang with it's like us kind of being left at the mall and our friends all left <laughs> Yeah. She does have, the gal said, uh, we made her day, and that the horse does have other, other friends. So. I have to say, when I turn Rocky loose, if I've had a nice time with him, and I bring him out, and he's got all his girls, so it's even better than that, because he's the only man with all these girls. <laughs> um, he loves his girls, but he will, he'll do the same thing. He'll kind of watch and be like, can I, can I get yeah. you to come back? Can I get one more scratch? Can I, can I, you know, and when I finally have really left the building, you know, he'll kind of, and then he'll turn around and then he'll go about his business. And so that's, you know, the dogs do that to you too. Like it, it, we're animals. We, we oh, all have this well, sense. We all do. And so one of the big pieces about uh, vagus nerve and the whole polyvagal theory is social engagement. That's, that's how, that's the part where we read those around us to know, is this safe? Is this okay? You know, like when something scary happens, you look at your friend and go, did you hear that? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And so we're doing that. We just don't necessarily recognize because it's so innate to us. We don't recognize we're going, oh yeah, I heard that sound, but it's okay. I know who that is. That was on my neighbor. And it was a, it wasn't a gunshot. It was just a, you know, a sound on their TV. Right? And you could actually communicate that <clears throat> if you're in one of those scary movies where you can't talk, you, <laughs> you, you could actually communicate all that just going. Yeah. Exactly. And you would do it. So someone asked a question. I work with rescue horses. A Pasofino does not want her ears touched. She is also blind in one eye. Do you have a body movement for me that would help me with this problem? The best suggestion for that is to um, see if you can befriend the, the wither area. That's a, a grooming area for horses. They'll, they'll scratch that area. There's, there's actually nerves in there that are really pleasure center nerves. So if you can scratch the grooming, uh, the wither area, maybe even rock a little bit, just don't rock the horse. You're not pushing the horse. You're just holding that area or near it and just kind of rocking yourself, relaxing yourself. Horses will go foot to foot to foot as they start to relax. And from there, you work up the mane. So you work from a, a happy center, up the mane, up the neck, and you get as far as you can until they have a little reaction yeah. and then you go back down. Even an ear 
flick back toward you right. as a reaction. And you go up and down and up and down and up and down until they're like, oh, this is nice. Because the back of the pole is also the center that horses use with each other to say, follow me. So it's a soft place. It's an emotional place. It's a place mothers will touch on their babies, follow me. And friends will uh, lay their necks across each other there. And it's follow me into relaxation, follow me into being connected. So um, you, if you can get there and get it nice and soft and relaxed, so you can go through to friendly, which is the front of the forehead. So you're going, and as you're doing this, of course, predictably they're dropping their head because it feels great. Mm -hmm. So my best advice for funkiness with the head is to start with the wither and go up the main. And be on the seeing side. Being on, be on the good side. Yeah. And, and just do a little bit at a time. Give yourself three or four days and just be like, I'm going to do a little bit each day and see how this gets. If you, if you take whatever the horse can give and you compliment them and praise them and say, good job, that's great, good job. Hey, I got three inches up, further up your neck today. Good job for you. As soon as you take the pressure off, you're not like, I got to touch your ear, yeah. right? It's not about the ear. It's about the horse building confidence with something that they could have a trauma around. You don't don't know yeah so building it from a, a happy pleasure center up to the weird place knowing that there's other buttons along the horse's top line that between horses are signals of friendship so if you can reach those other buttons that are signals of friendship and have a good encounter with them then you're more likely to start working on building some trust around the ears and the horse may never like their ears touched so I wouldn't expect a horse to go oh yeah now I love it but if they can tolerate it, that I'll take it. Yeah, and bre implementing some breathing while you're doing that and just have no, no true agenda, just creating enrichment in that area. And yeah, you have, you want to touch the ears, but don't even think about that. Just hang out and have a nice time building some trust. Someone else says, my mare doesn't like me rocking the baby anywhere on her. I do it in hot potato mode, but she will, uh, will she grow into it once she realizes what I'm trying to do? So just don't touch the horse. There are some horses who it's overwhelming to have physical contact and the rocking sensation. It's just too much to, it, it, there's some horses like their nerves are more alive or their sensitivity is so high. So in that case, you just stand next to them and just rock yourself. Don't even try to touch it. Yeah. And, and by rocking yourself, the signal that goes through the herd, you'll see horses do this with other horses. They're stepping foot to foot. And that's what we see on the sure foot pads, yeah. mm -hmm. is that they start rocking. So somebody's okay. asked a question. I said, my horse normally lives out 24 seven. He was moved to a new barn and lives in a stall while recuperating from an injury with a small turnout and hand walking. How can I interact with him in the stall to make him feel better? Do you mind if I take that one? Absolutely. This is where the surefoot pads can be so absolutely helpful in the recovery of your horse, not only to keep muscle tone, but also to create relaxation. And um, the suggestion is that you work with all the good legs, the, the uninjured legs using surefoot pads. And I would start with hard because we don't want to create a lot of instability in the beginning. Um, but the hard pads, which are going to give to heat and pressure, I can show you some pictures of that to see what hard pads look like. Um, but the surefoot pads are a great way to help horses who, especially when they've been in work or they've been in turnout and now they have to be in a stall, um, you know, that can be pretty hard on horses to make that transition. And so this is, this is just a pair of hooves on a hard pad. Um, and let's see if I have a body picture here. Oh, that, that's a physio pad, but you can see this, the, the lovely eye and the soft relaxation. That's kind of a weird angle of the picture. Um, and here's another horse on hard pads. So basically you place the pads underneath the feet that the horse will A, pick up for you. It can be just one foot to start with, that's totally fine. And avoid the injured leg until you have that approval that it's okay to work with sure foot on the injured leg. So that's really, really important, have a good diagnosis, talk to your vet about using sure foot. But the degree of relaxation that sure foot can bring in for a horse that has now, you know, hand walking, and you can do this as part of your walk, um, I'll just show you this little video. So, guys, can you see this? Yeah, that's great. Um, this horse has been on pads before, and we've stacked her. Um, Is that an illusion? Uh, she's a Lusitano. Lusitano. And she's on a hard pad with a slant, but you notice we have the slant angled. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Right? 
And you can see, Sharon, if you want to comment on anything that you see or do, that's totally cool. Well, she's adjusting her atlas there. Then there's a stop. You, you can stop right there. Yeah. So this is important for people to see because it, now there could have been a noise, but this is so typical and we tend to blow by it and not paying attention to it. However, that's a very significant message. She went from dopey to scan the horizon. And that's what we were talking about in the beginning, that they never stop scanning. So for a horse I'll just to take it back and start from the beginning. Yeah. How's that? Please. So as you see, she's dopey here. There's a little tail switch. That's internal. She's concentrating. She's internal inside herself, concentrating ears. A lot of lip, lip action. Lip, 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 move, 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 move. And she's adjusting her atlas a little bit. She's feeling what, she's in her bones. She's in herself. She's in her own little world. And she's going pretty deep. She's doing a reset with her muzzle. See the muzzle twi twiggle in there? There's a lot there. Lots going on, right? And so all, all those nerve endings that end right here. And there's actually, stop right there for a second. Do you want me to unshare? No, no it's fine. No, nope. she's, yeah, she's just grabbing Georgette. Look at the... Here, I'll unshare and I can come back to it. Okay. Look at the, where we go? This, nerves come out right here. Oh, wow. See, they come out here and here, and then there's... The trigeminal little, come out on the sides, right? Yeah, and then there's these little uh, keepers right there, these little bony nodules. And that holds that, pre uh, I think the ocular nerve, I'm not Hang sure. On, the, I'm gonna make you guys the facial nerve comes see here. This better. Hang on, spotlight. Then down here. So isn't that neat? There's all these places where they come out. I never noticed the one right there just above the front incisors. Yeah. Like, and then here. How cool is that? Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. So that helps explain a lot. You've got, you've got these little bony nodules here. You've got bony nodules. Where's the other ones? I don't have this all memorized. Every time, every time our um, specialist comes, she teaches me more about. Who's your specialist? Uh, Sarah, Sarah. Sarah Twickler. So, do I need to have Sarah as a guest? I'd like to have Sarah as a guest. I think she. We'll tell her. We'll tell her she should get. Okay, that. great. I think because just that little bit that you've shown us is so fascinating that I would love to have her as a guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is, is her skull. She. This is her skull. This is <laughs> too this okay. is her, I have one too. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So it, it's really interesting. And then look at this. This bony ridge it's is just so, so pointy. It's amazing. How right, and then you've got the cartilage, and this is why it's so important to have properly fitted nose bands and halters yep. because that's soft down below there. And you, this horse actually looks like it might have been damaged as the way it curves down. Like there's been yeah, it's it's got a it's got a look dip. At, there's nerves, you know, these right are the nerves. there. That's where the halter sits. That's exactly where it bands. sits, and it's just amazing. So when I'm when I'm touching a horse here, I'm doing I call feather touch, like this. So I. So if, I, if I'm asking a horse, if I do put a little bit of pressure, this feather here, and then I'm rocking here, and then if I need to touch a little bit more with, my, with the pads of my fingers, you know, to make an example, but I start with feather touches because look at the nerves and look at all this delicate stuff. Absolutely. So a lot of times you try to touch a horse, you know this, Wendy, a lot of times you try to touch a horse here and they're like, don't even. Right. Don't, even about it. don't come near me there. Yeah. So when that mare, when she's twiggling well, her let's lips, let's go back to the video. Okay. Yeah, let's go back to the video. Let's hang out. Yeah, just um, hang out. Because first. now that we have that information, I'm gonna just watch her face. Right. And you can watch. And you can see where the halter sits right on those little nerve entry points to the face. Yeah. The, Which the, the nodules of the rope halter sit right on those nerve points. Yep, this halter is a little loose fitting, so I think the nerve points are a little bit higher. For They're a little bit higher, yeah. you're correct. Glad yep. to see that it's a little loose fitting. And I will say that I will use a rope halter sometimes with a horse. When I'm saying, I, you know, if a horse has learned to pull or push through a, a flat halter, and I just want to say, let's just not practice that. I don't want a horse practicing pulling and pushing. And so I'll use it as an aid, but I use it very aware and conscious. So I don't yeah. think that anything, any tack and stuff is inherently bad most of the time. I think it's the way you use it and how you understand it. Yes, and, and one of the things I find with the rope halters with Surefoot is it's A, it's a lot of weight, right? Because you've got yeah. the weight of the rope. But also, if you make a little movement, it sort of magnifies down the line and can yes. be very disturbing to horses because they're going to be reactive rather than this horse is not, okay? And I right. will this horse is not, but you'll see a lot of horses that are very active. And so as just as they're about to doze off or to feel something, they're reacting. And so I, 
I tend to prefer a flat halter, but in this case, like I said, you can see the rope is slack. Yeah, um, this, this horse is fine with it. Yep, but so watch, watch right here because- Watch wriggling, yeah. Yeah, she does this little tiny nod and look at how this, I, I don't know if people can see how this is reflecting all the way yes. down through into the chest. So I'll exactly. do it again, right? There she's, a, she's closing in and see, see that little muscle movement right there where the dirt spot is? That's like C5 or C6? Yeah, C5, yeah. I think it's C5. Five. Yep, and then we've got our eye blinks, mm -hmm. then our scan the horizon. Right. And this is what I wanted to point out to people at that moment, uh, what, what horses, this is so typical, they're going deeper, going deeper, they're processing, something's happening, something's moving, and suddenly they have to snap out of it and be like, whoa, 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 where am I? What's going on? What, is it safe? And so for the human being, if we can respond to that moment, pay attention to what they paid attention to, look where they looked, and point and say, yep, yeah, that boogeyman is not going to get you. you. I will make sure you're safe. And just do these same things like you it, you would say to a person i got it yep you're okay calm down it's the same messages that we would do for somebody else and in, and in this case this is her home so you can see that while she looks there's probably a sound i turned the sound off sure it comes back really quickly yes right there look at that look at that big flare. nostril flare and twiggle she pulls and that nostril all flare. yep big nostril flare eye blinks then you can see her starting to go down again. Right. Oh, there's Now look at this, Sharon. Yeah, yeah look at that. Other. Yeah, look at up the front leg, mm -hmm. the right front leg. Yep. Mm -hmm. And she's and, really yeah, she adjusting. adjusting. Processed all the way through to the all tail. All the way through to the tail and then done. Yeah, and then readjust the hind end. I was noticing that her hind and end And if, really if you back wide. up a little bit, when she settles her hind end, she does her occiput at the same time. She does her occipital, watch. When she there's gets off the yeah. pad, she does a little tail swish because she felt that all the in way through. Ear. She adjusts her hind, watch right behind. Oh yeah, right there. Be right there. there. There goes the hind leg and there goes her occipital. So cranial sacral. She's Very doing cool. Sacral, she's doing her cranial. So that's, it's really, really cool. And I find that horses do this reset. They, they do this um, twiggling on their muzzle. They'll even want to press, put it into the dirt and press. If you know how to do it, you can offer your knuckle. They can put it into your knuckle and press. They can put it into a barrel, any object, the wall sometimes. And it's their way of like rebooting. Like I got to reboot. Yep. Very right. common to see that they'll do that. With, they'll put their muzzle on the ground or on the pad and, and wiggle their muzzle. Right. Um, right. But you know, it's, it's always so much fun, Sharon, to show you these videos because when I show them to you, I slow them down and I scrub them. And there's so much going on that you don't, pick up in real time. Right. Right. But right. then when you slow it down and you start to watch it like this, you go, oh, wait a second. There is so much going on there. And so it's, yeah. it's one of the really fun things. I know we've got a couple of questions that came in. Yeah. yeah it's fun for me too, because the slow down, we, we really don't, we haven't learned to pay attention. We pay attention to the big stuff. The big stuff catches our eye and wakes us up and says, right. look at this. We but did. the little stuff is Sorry. where they're talking. They're talking when it's little. When, they, when they're when they big, they're screaming. <laughs> right, we right, did. and that's what we tend to, we tend to need the, to see the bigger screams. So I've got another video for you. We have, uh, my horse has start, uh, started wanting to lick me on uh, my hand or even on my leg when we are just calmly hanging out. Sometimes I am seated, horse on loose lead, and he will reach his nose toward my uh, toward me to lick me. How should I interpret this action? Will it encourage him to nip? Again, if you can offer your knuckle you want to the muzzle. Here's my, my brer horse. Here's Dottie. Oh, there's Dottie. Okay. There's Dottie. So if you can offer your knuckle so that there's this, a sweep like this, this, it, you'll see horses do muzzle on muzzle to each other sometimes. And you'll see them go up to the side of another horse and rub their muzzle. So they will assist each other in their greeting or in their touching to get that connection with each other. And to, that's the first thing is to get the right. Sorry. This means lick me anyway. Your palm means lick. So if you're doing this and then you flip your hand over, almost all the time a horse will open their mouth and go da da da. So sometimes the horse is saying, do you want me to lick you? Horses don't lick in a greeting. Dogs do, but horses don't. 
So if a horse is licking excessively, usually there's something going on. And what they're saying is, can you help me? And so this, what you saw the mare doing with the lip twiggling, if you kind of get in there and offer them some of this, that helps them to relieve, or they'll get their jaw opened up and they're just using you as an assist to their own well-being. And, and, and the tricky part there is doing that while they're on the pads because sometimes that can actually disturb it, them. It, it can help. disturb them, right. But she, she's talking about she's just hanging out with the horse. Yep, and, got it. Yep, so no if you always want to define your space is the second answer to this question. So if, you do, if you're not sure, you know, or if you like it a little bit, I, I'll like things. Like I like it if a horse wants to sniff my face or whatever. And then I say that's enough. So always I'm the one to define the bubble and I'm the one to say, Whoops. thank you, that was really sweet, I like you too, but that's enough. And that's what they're looking for. So the, the second half of this question is, always be okay defining your own space because horses do that with other horses. So even you know, if they're- You're just talking about boundaries and we yes. all want clear and concise boundaries. Um, the worst is when, you know, the boundary's constantly changing and you don't know, is it okay? Is it not? like, just think about, you know, walking into your boss's office every day and every day is in a different mood and you don't know, you know, today, can I peek in the door? Oh no. Uh, you know, the, the next day, oh, I can march right in. And it's, and it's the inconsistency I think that makes for nuttiness. Yes. Um, and that when we're consistent, this is my space. Yes, you can enter my space. No, today you need to stay over there, but this is my space. Th that helps everyone. Um, yeah. You know, it's always fascinating when you're, when you're um, in other cultures, and I'll never forget one time when my friend and I were in Fiji and we boarded a plane and an East Indian woman had a baby and she plopped it into my friend's lap. <laughs> no respect <Yeah>. for boundaries. <laughs> like, my friend had to take care of the baby while she sorted herself out on the seat. And we were like horrified. Wow. Right? Um, <laughs> And that's, you know, that's an invasion of our bubbles. And you know, how often do we do that to horses? We just plop things into their space and go deal with this. You know? And they're like, wait a second, what about, yes. well, you know, my personal space? So, you know, I always think that it's, it, if we relate it back to how we feel about these simple concepts, we, we are always, uh, whether consciously or not, we have these same concepts of boundaries and respect and grounding and secure and safety. Yeah. Um, that boundaries help make better bonding and friends and friends <laughs> yes. yes and so i think sometimes people are confused and they feel like oh if i set a limit or i set a boundary with the horse they're not going to like me anymore right and and that's because that's where we're anthropomorphizing because it's the opposite the, right. the more clean you are just think of it as being clean with your boundary and clear focused the less anxiety the horse has, because like you said, they're not like, what, what is my boss doing today? You know, one day I can waltz right in and the next day they scream as soon as they look at me. And that, that makes horses crazy. So having clean, clear boundaries allows you to have more and more and more affection actually, because there's a way to say that's enough. And there's a way for them to say that's enough without needing to drive you, bite you, push you, dump right. you, get, you know, so if they know that, oh, either of us could say that's enough, the human will listen, the horse will listen. That's mutual respect, right back to what we were talking about. Right, no. And and so then, you know, I think what we need to just briefly touch on is this concept of learned helplessness when mm. um, when those boundaries have been violated at a, at a very early age. And um, I, we have not talked about the concept of imprinting, um, but I think that you know, when we look at some of the things that people are doing with their foals, and I, I inadvertently imprinted a foal at birth, not even knowing that I was doing it. Um, mm -hmm. The foal was born, and I went in, and I handled it, and I rubbed it all over, and it wasn't anything aggressive, but that horse was never a normal boundary, respective boundaries horse. It was, and, and then there was a lot of people around that then continued that because there were children, and so the horse didn't learn it was a horse. It lost that boundary. And then that's when we have serious boundary problems that are going to be for the rest of that horse's life because we, we, did, we interrupted the normal process, which we as humans capitalize on this sense that we, can, you know, we have bubbles. Um, it's how we can be smaller and yet 
create that space for horses. So absolutely. Yeah. Until right. you learn horse speak, then you can <laughs> learn about the go away face button. And yeah. it's also known as the come here face button. So it, it, someone, a couple people asked, yeah. a, a few people asked, how do you set these good boundaries? And I, I just want to say, we have a ton of we have books and webinars and things that, because there's a very simple answer, which is that this is how horses set it. They use this button here in the cheek. It's the number one way that horses set boundaries is they start there. But for us, it depends on who you are, how, what your comfort zone is. Are you an X person? You probably don't need to set boundaries if you're an X person. <laughs> you're just a walking boundary. But if you're an O person, it might be not normal for you to set a boundary. Or if you're really O-ish, O, making an O, around your horse because you're like, I like you so much and I want you to feel safe with me, then you're sucking them into your bubble all the time. So even if you set a boundary, it's the moment you drop your yeah. hand, they the horse is going to go I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. So for some people, we have to practice maintaining. It's not about setting it, it's about keeping it. And some people need to actually just walk around with a light hand, fingertips in the air, for a couple of days or a couple of weeks because they need to imprint this boundary into their own posture. Horses are fine with it once they know you're going to be consistent. But we're the ones that are like, I put my hand down, the horse said, you look like an O, went, oh, I'm back. Just that subtlety, do it again. So here, that. So his shoulders went down? Yeah. Yep, went down. So some horses, they go, looks like an O, here I come. Yep. So that's important to note that you, and you can not, you're not offensive, you're just hold the horse. You're just, Sorry. you're just, you can pat and then they press in, push in, and then the fingers. No, stay right there. Pat, push in. Just stay right there. Put your head away. And, and, and we're back to the consistency here because those horses that have uh, lost clear boundaries need yes. reinforcement daily. I mean, yes. you cannot fall asleep on them. Right. Yes. We're, we're like, Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I yeah. have one in, in the barn and he, he, he's 17 and when he came at four, he had no clear boundaries and we had to establish those and then, but it's, it's constant. It's always yeah. reminding him that there is a boundary and he needs to respect, which he, he, the more consistent, and he's had a lot of years where he didn't have any, a lot of handling, but he's, the more consistent you are, the less you have to do, but it, you cannot right. <laughs> And, you know, your hands and your feet, that's all you really need. And that even using two hands, if a horse is becoming way on top, using one hand, the left hand at the go away face, and maybe even a little bit at the shoulder or mid neck button. If you're on left side. Yes, if you're on the left side. And then you're turning your core as well. So you're beaming your core in front of their chest to help stop the forward movement. So it's a pivot toward. Right. And so, so your entire being is in on it. And so I wanted to, do you want to answer this question uh, from Annette about a horse who's bitten people and? Yeah, you know, cribbing is one of the most difficult things. Um, no one has a good answer to cribbing. And I don't know that you do um, because they're getting so many neurochemicals that are, it's crack. Yeah. Um, but the fact that the horse has bitten people while cleaning the water bucket, I think that, in what exactly what you're talking about you have to establish clear boundaries and you know don't be afraid to increase your body space by using a stick and using that to give you more space to clear the horse out of a situation yeah. like this yeah right and just don't flail right don't do right. that just clear just clear Cop, stop hand Cop, stop stay there right because this looks like ah! it doesn't yeah. look like go you could do one and then maybe you do another one but if yeah. you're doing flapping it doesn't register and most horses just stop because if when you watch other horses do make a boundary there's one thing that's right. it and then they're done and, and that's so that's where you know i was talking with like with the tellington jones work you can you can use a, a stick to increase your body space yes and, and like a windshield wiper so that you're saying this is my space and you stay over there because right. what this tells me if he's bitten two people is they haven't cleared him out of the space to get to the water bucket right yeah. and right. um they if they go in fearful um he's only going to approach because yeah. there's something going on yeah. um so it's just you know and if he's cribbing in the first place, that's displacement. Yeah. So that's already right. there's anxiety. Already there's some, some, 
perhaps the horse has an ulcer. There could be chicken and egg. Right. There you know? is. Um, so our, one of our horses, actually, Mummy, she does crib every so often. And we have found that using um, the vet recommended trying some bio sponge. It's a powder mm. that we put into her food. And that has helped soothe whatever's going on in her stomach. And she has she cribs sick much, much, much less. less. Right. Yeah. And she's just less. So they can have emotional tension because they don't feel well. Right. right. And then they act out like we do. Like if you're cranky, if you don't feel good, you, you're not right. And someone says, can you do it? You're like, no, I can't do that right yeah. now. You know, and so there's, we might be snappy also because we don't feel well. So anxiety, discomfort, physical discomfort, mental discomfort, emotional discomfort, they all, it's a big, it's a big soup. Yeah. And so setting a boundary is how I'm going to maintain my safety, but then saying, well, the horse is cribbing. So in the first place, the horse is having an experience and they're now addicted to these chemicals, and whatever, but what's going on for them? Chicken and egg was it an emotional thing that caused them to crib or did they get a stomach problem? And now they're, they're emotional because they have oh. a stomach problem. So have you seen the response here? She says, the, um, um, she's an equine iridologist and, um, the digestive issues. These digestive yeah. issues. So Annette, please email me at wendy at wendymurdoch.com because I would love to do a webinar on equine iridology. I think that would be mm -hmm. really yeah. Yeah. amazing. Yeah, um, another thing we're using too with Rocky from having colic surgery and all that kind of stuff for maintenance for him is um, it's Purina, it's called Outlast and it's a gastro type gastro. supplement. So um, we have noticed a, a significant amount yeah. of that too. I think what we can say fairly is that there are often stomach issues that are associated with cribbing. The problem is once cribbing gets to a certain degree, it becomes its own addiction because of yeah. the chemicals that they're getting from the action of cribbing. And it is one of the more, if it's ingrained, one of the more difficult things to, you know, Surefoot's, People ask me if Surefoot can help cribbing, and I, I can't say definitively that it can, but any type of relaxation is going to help the horse. And we've right. had, with the reset button, doing one, like, firm, one, down. two, three, like that. You're really, you're really allowing yourself to embrace that lip of the horse. So if you do that the first time, the horse may say, I don't know, what you, why are you doing that? Why are you rubbing my lip? And they may make a face and be like, what are you... But nine times out of 10, seriously, they come right back and go, oh my God, that felt great. Do it again. Do please. it again. Do it again. <laughs> well, because I that's know. a lot of what, that's that emotional center of the limbic system is right. Yes. And, yep. um, you know, Linda Tellington Jones forever has talked about, you know, working your own lip if you're oh. anxious. And <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's so fun to see all the common threads that keep tying together and how, you know, um, horse speak and the Tellington Jones work and the understanding of the nervous system and it all keeps coming back and that's you know one of the things that I'm trying to do with these webinars is give people lots of different avenues into the same thing the horse um, and see how from all these different aspects so many of us are actually keying into similar systems yeah yeah and good communication involves self-awareness absolutely absolutely so who yeah. shall we watch another video Sure, um, yep, I got one. I don't know how much time we have left. Oh, I let's watch our, one more. Our clock, oh, it we'll doesn't do matter. We can hang all day. I, mean, <laughs> I know, I know. She goes um, to the doctor, but. <laughs> hey, let me just do this one. I find, th th this is a, 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 if I remember right, he was a thoroughbred. As you can see, he, he's in an environment that's not his home. Mm -hmm. um, he's been here, I think, once before that I worked with Surefoot with him. Um, and I just thought it was an interesting video. I played it the other day on my, on my webinar. Um, he's looking out a very large door, which would be where they bring the tractor and if they're gonna drag the arena, right? And there's a lot of activity outside of the space. But I'll let it run first and then I'll go back because there's some really interesting things that we see happen here. Just wanna say that where he stepped forward, rubbed his kneecap, that what I call that is having a, a learning something moment. And so that's how horses talk to themselves. And, and so learning something may not be exactly it all the time, but it's something like an aha. Yeah. Right there. They'll do that when they go, aha. Okay. And he came off of staring out the door. He looked inward and he was like, oh, I'm on these, these pads. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And so, this, and the reason I bring this up is this is not unusual. Like a lot of people think, oh, my horse is not paying attention. Right. But you'll put them on the pads. And I, and I 
Well, there are other things that we could do with the horses. The pads are often so powerful, like there's so much the horse has to pay attention to that adding yeah. anything else to the scene becomes disruptive to the horse. And so while I, you know, you guys talk about, you know, blowing away boogeymen and stuff like that, a lot of times what I like to do is just observe the horse to see how, how is he going to process this piece of information? Right. So, well, Someone says they're not seeing the video. Yep. Yeah. So while yes, you could do things with horse speak, that what I want people to realize is that there's an intentionality in not doing those things to observe. And so one of the things to observe here is how fixed his eye is, right? No blinking, mm -hmm. right? And then little nostril flare, he's smelling the air, mm -hmm. right? And then the ears are fixed. Right, right here, watch the rib cage. He just rolls his rib cage to the right. Watch the rider. And I'll do it a couple of times. So here it is more upright. And here he rolls the whole rib cage. So again, going back to the point that, you know, we're focusing on the fact that he's staring out the door, but look at what he's doing in his body. So oh, yeah, he's rocking. He's, yeah, he's rocking and rolling with right. that. And there's many instances where horses appear not to be paying attention, but they are fully engaged in what's going on. Yes. Just like people that look off into the distance. Okay, so now this is the kind of interesting part, Sharon. Failed switch. Yeah. Right. We get, okay. So here he's, he's, uh, I've backed it up a little bit. Okay. Here's that rib cage roll. Yeah. He's lean to the right, right. Picks up that hind foot with a tail flick. Yeah. He twiggled the shoulder first. First. Yeah. And then readjusted, did the lift did the and lift. the tail swish. Right. And now look at the shoulder muscling, right? Yeah. yeah. The right shoulder. And then he steps the foot down and look at how the weight shifts forward onto that right front. Right. Yeah. And look at the shoulder, like right here. Yep. Whoop. The sh the the re reaction in the shoulder muscles, mm -hmm. right there. And the and the pectoral muscles. Yep. Absolutely. Shoulder thoracic thing. Yeah. And then another roll of the rib cage. Big shoulder wow. wobble yep. right there. Right. Like he buckles his knee a little bit, and yeah. then sets it back down. It's All the while, like if you only looked at his head, you'd think he wasn't paying attention, right? Yes. <laughs> Right. And then here's the acknowledgement, like you said. Yeah. Right. Blinking. So he's like, aha. Uh -huh. So whatever. So he was split. Half of him was internal and half of him was out there, like checking the horizon, making sure it was OK. And <clears throat> when he decided that it was OK out there, it was also OK in here. I and like that he big, went. Yeah, like, I like that he went oh, to yeah. sniff the surefoot pads. I bet he wanted to reset his, his muzzle on them. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's you're right. Reset. There's his muzzle. See, there's the huge the flare. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I'll just play that in real time. Um, so because that's the thing is in real time, it's so hard to pick up a lot of these really subtle nuances that are going on while they're on the pods. Yeah. But then when you know, to, it's just like horse speak. When you know what to look for, you can see all the signs. Yes. Mm -hmm. That that was yeah, big. That big. the shoulder flinch was really big. Yeah. Yep. And then that came, and then he was like, "Aha." Uh -huh. So you would think that like, he did that shoulder flinch, whatever that meant for him, he went, aha, and I'm done yeah. with these pads now. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of release. And if she had just, you know, like, if she had the reins a little more forward, I think he would have put his nose on the pads. And I yeah. do too. can't always be perfect in our responses to things. Right. Sure, that's fine. He got what he needed though. Yeah. And he, and he also backed himself, but he could have come forward, he could have gone sideways, but he actually backed away. And backing up is something that horses use for themselves to get like back in their body. So they get embodied when they roll backwards. And so he chose to roll backwards dealing with the pads. And we've right. seen, you and I, I've seen horses not roll backwards. I've seen them crab sideways and do <laughs> all kinds of things. Yes, we've seen lots of things. <laughs> but it was so interesting because he, you know, all the scanning and then the acknowledgement, oh my body, oh my feet, oh my, this is, and that this actually had an influence. Yes. Uh, and, and then he was much quieter and softer and more present, which is, you know, one of the things that we see with Surefoot is getting the horses in their body, getting them grounded, getting them more secure. Um, and it's always so much fun to show you videos because you have such a fabulous eye and a great takeaway, uh, both of you, on the content. But now you're an addict because you were like, watch the shoulder! <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, usually I'm, I, I, I'm there in real time and I'm busy with six other things in my head, watching and seeing and making yeah. sure the rider doesn't interfere in... Um, and that's, so, so, um, we're getting close to the end, but I would love you guys to tell everybody a little bit more about your program. Okay. So we 
have a lot of different things that we're doing. We have a regular stream of webinars that we're putting out so that people can learn. Like everyone's asked these great questions. And um, we try to incorporate all these kinds of the, the typical daily life with a horse uh, and break them down into chunks that people can learn from. The most recent webinar we did was postures, gestures, and signals. So we basically talked about our body posture and then what hand gestures we can make that then define a signal, which is basically hold right there. Okay. You know, and then and we have a couple more coming up and I apologize, I didn't write down, but if you it's check okay. out the website, um, we actually have um, used Teachable as our online platform. Um, so we have all of our webinars are available there. And we also are running um, certification. As, well, we are starting our next certification. Uh, stay tuned um, on the newsletter for when we open up enrollment. It's just a small group of folks. So uh, we're going to take a dozen people. So the space will be very limited, as well as every week we are doing, uh, we call two hour Tuesdays. And so basically we have our club. And so it's $30 a month to get eight hours of specific training. So if you have the opportunity to send a two minute video or you know up to no more than five minutes and we will analyze that video so whether it's a herd dynamic video or you're doing some stuff with your horse we put you live on the audio with us so you're getting direct feedback from us so that you're getting a bunch of feedback and then the tips that you can go back home and try and we've had some really fascinating breakthroughs the first six weeks we had yeah. one gal bringing in a lot of videos and she's had profound it's changes a little bit of a it was a little bit of a, a, a saga yeah you know? and like and then so our first round of certification people um are are having a good time and some and of them are actually some on of them this are here right hi. hi everybody <laughs> uh, and so what we're trying to to provide is is a, a reasonable approach to learning how to do horse body language with your body language it, it takes a little bit of time to really get you know if you want to go there but um it's really fun so yeah, so and, and you guys have forgotten so so if horse speak is new to you you can always read the horse speak book which is fabulous yeah. just to give you a sense and a taste of what these guys are talking about so you can get into it and then you know what i was thinking is why don't we just we can send out an email with all the links Sure. sure. The people that so so what we'll do is um, I'll get together with Sharon and we'll all right, and we'll send out a link to everybody who's subscribed to the Sharon Wilsey's webinars and um, and we'll get you uh, information on all those things yeah. that that they've got going on. We have two books, a third book on the way in October, and a training DVD. So two hours of packed, basic horse speak right out of the get go. We have a stoic horse, a hesitant horse, and an outgoing <laughs> horse. So you if you're interested in learning quickly about how to deal with that space invader type horse. The very first horse in the demo is a space invader. So you'll get a lot of information on how to help you, you know, work with that kind of energy. Super. Well, thank you guys so much. It's a pleasure. We'll probably see you back in a couple of weeks, right? Great. We're hanging out. We're yeah. We just keep this going. You, you know, you're my, my most, uh, we've had more webinars with you guys, but you know what? They're always so popular and I just really love uh, getting a chance to chat with you because that's the only way we're going to do it right now is, is I know. Yeah, I know. And, and as always, it's wonderful to see you and to be a part of the Surefoot thing. I love, I love watching horses just get that reboot and get that, get some of their own needs met, get some little my time, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank all you right. all the participants who decided to come and join us today. We really appreciate all your enthusiasm and we look forward to working with you in whatever capacity this pandemic allows us to do so. So thank you so much. And just remember everybody, tomorrow I do not have a webinar. We're taking one day off. We'll be back on Wednesday with, I know I, it's a long story, Dr. Joyce Harmon, and we'll be talking about homeopathy for horses. So please be sure to sign up for that, register for that webinar. You can do that at the surefootequine.com website on the calendar. And um, of course, all of these webinars are posted up on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. You can go there and find your favorite webinars. And we're hoping to make them all into podcasts, the ones that are gonna work so that those of you, we get people telling us, I'm driving my car and I listen to your webinars. Well, we're trying to make that easier by setting up some podcasts. Stay tuned, we'll give you more information when we have it. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining me. It's been a pleasure, you. stay well. And um, Bridget and says bye-bye. Everyone oh, says yeah, bye, Dottie. Oh, bye, Dottie. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Bye, everybody. Bye. bye.